Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Sanyal Shulton, the Deputy Head of HCV Access at FIND, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics. And today, I'll be speaking on diagnostics for hepatitis B, what we have. Now, you may have joined us for the other two webinars that we did, uh, Diagnostics for Hepatitis C, what we have, and Diagnostics for Hepatitis C, how to use what we have to be uh, impactful in service delivery. So if you've joined us for those two uh, videos and are coming back, welcome back. And if you are joining us for the first time today for Diagnostics for Hepatitis B, welcome. I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day um, to do a little bit of a deep dive into hepatitis B diagnostics. We certainly know that COVID-19 has changed our world and a lot of people are really occupied um, dealing with and addressing COVID-19. We also know that COVID-19 has presented a lot of challenges to existing health programs, such as any existing progress um, and health programs for hepatitis. So thanks for making time today to, to join us. You may also be wondering why somebody with the title of uh, uh, hepatitis C in, in the name is talking about hepatitis B. And that's because um, all viral hepatitis is important. And when we were speaking with World Hepatitis Alliance about the idea for this series of webinars, we initially approached them thinking about hepatitis C and um, WHA let us know that C is, is important, but also hepatitis B is important for uh, their members as well. So they asked if we could do a series on, on B. And it's important because hepatitis B and the diagnostics, it can seem pretty daunting, it can seem pretty challenging. And the aim of what we hope to do today is provide you with some information to kind of demystify hepatitis B diagnostics, to be um, one of the things you have in your toolkit. So when you are talking with stakeholders and policymakers, um, you know, we can assist you in being strong in getting that message out there to increase service delivery for people living with hepatitis B. So a little bit of background about FIND. Uh, FIND is a global nonprofit driving diagnostic innovations to combat major diseases affecting the world's poorest populations. And um, we have offices in Vietnam, India, Kenya, South Africa, and Geneva, Switzerland. And right now we focus on six disease areas, antimicrobial resistance, neglected tropical diseases, hepatitis C and HIV, pandemic preparedness, which that team has been very busy in the COVID-19 world, um, malaria and fever, and tuberculosis. So to explain, we're building off of some past webinars and what to expect in this one. So for this webinar, we are assuming that you're already familiar with the basics of hepatitis C diagnostics from the previous webinar. And in that uh, video, we did cover some basic tenets such as what are in vitro diagnostics, um, what the term sensitivity and specificity mean, and regulatory overviews. So what is um, World Health Organization pre-qualification? What is Global Fund Expert Review Panel for Diagnostics? What does it mean when we say something has stringent regulatory authority? Um, so if you haven't uh, watched those videos or would like to brush up on that, you can find it through the link on the screen and it's minute 122 to 925. Also, in this webinar, we're going to focus on the various tests available for hepatitis B and have a close look at those recommended in the WHO hepatitis B testing guidelines. We are not going to cover hepatitis B transmission or disease progression because that is um, complicated and deserves its own uh, specific dedicated um, session and experts that uh, can talk to that. So we linked to two videos that give some short overviews on viral hepatitis in general. Um, that may be useful. And we also recommend that you check out um, resources that may be available on WHO website, um, WHO being World Health Organization website, or your Ministry of Health, um, your country Ministry of Health may have some recommendations and, and useful information, as well as the WHO regional and country offices. So the global situation. Why are we talking about hepatitis B today? Now, many of you um, may, may well be aware of the disease burden, but just to, to put some numbers to help put the disease burden in context. You know, WHO estimates that in 2015, 257 million people were living with chronic hepatitis B infection. And that is defined as hepatitis B surface antigen positive. We'll explain a little bit more about um, those tests when we come to it in a few slides. 
And in 2015, it's estimated that uh, almost 900,000 people um, uh, died because of hepatitis B, mostly from cirrhosis and hepatotel hep hepatocellular carcinoma. It's always a tongue twister, um, sometimes referred to HCC, and that's meaning primary liver cancer. As of 2016, 27 million people who are living with hepatitis B were aware of their infection. And of those, 4.5 million um, were on treatment. So um, that means out of the 257 million people living with chronic hepatitis B, only 27 million people were aware. Um, that's a big gap. But there is some good news. So according to the latest WHO estimates, the proportion of children under five years of age chronically infected with hepatitis B dropped to just under 1% in 2019. And that's down from around 5% in the pre-vaccine era. Um, so that's showing that things such as birth dose vaccine and the um, hepatitis B uh, infant vaccine are making an impact. Now, to speak specifically about hepatitis B HIV co-infection. So around 1% of the people living with hepatitis B infection are also infected with HIV. Or another way to look at that is um, around 7% of people living with HIV are also infected with hepatitis B. This comes out to about 2.7 million people. So since 2015, the WHO has recommended treatment for everyone diagnosed with HIV infection. So that is HIV treatment, ART, for everyone diagnosed with HIV infection. Tenofovir, which is included in the treatment combination recommendations as a first-line therapy for HIV infection, is also active against hepatitis B. So to put those numbers that I just <laughs> listed off into a visual context, I mean, I'm a visual thinker, so I'd like to see everything um, in graphs. So here we see the graph of um, the number of infected. So there's this big number, over 250 million people. And then we see the number diagnosed, which is less than 30 million. And then of that, the number started in treatment. If we look here, we see that the gap to reach the 2030 target, the 2030 WHO target for elimination of hepatitis, um, we need to diagnose over 200 million people. And then we need to get those people who are eligible for treatment started on treatment. Now, it's a little bit tricky because not everybody who is diagnosed as hepatitis B service antigen positive needs treatment right away. This is because there is no cure currently for hepatitis B. So the treatment that people um, could be put on uh, could be very long lasting, sometimes for life. So there are um, various clinical uh, markers or clinical stages that they want a person to be at to initiate them on hepatitis B treatment. And this is usually um, defined through the hepatitis B DNA. We'll cover that in our list of tests. So who is recommending what? Where are all these guidelines coming from? Well, there are several different guidelines that are currently available. There's a nice overview by Huang et al, which is a hepatitis B who to treat, a critical review of international guidelines. That can be found, it's linked here on the slide. Um, and those guidelines cover the, the, the big ones. The first being the World Health Organization, or WHO as I'll refer to it from now on, their 2017 hepatitis B testing guidelines and their 2020 hepatitis B prevention of mother to child transmission guidelines. There's also the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, um, also known as AASLD. There's the Asian Pacific Association of the Liver, PASL, and then there's the European Association of the Study of the Liver, EASL. So for today, we're gonna to be focusing on the WHO guidelines. This is because they have that global scope. So let's do a kind of term terminology overview before we jump into the guidelines and which where each test fits along that pathway. So here we have a table of some of the most common hepatitis B tests. This is not an exhaustive list, but we wanted to provide the ones that you um, may most often run into. Now, if you would like additional information about any of these tests, the Hepatitis B Foundation has a really nice um, overview about the name of the test, what it is, what the various results could mean. So um, if you'd like to, you can check them out and we've linked it in the slide. To start, we've got the hepatitis B surface antigen, and that is a test for a uh, protein found on the surface of the hepatitis B virus. It is in the WHO guidelines, and it is part of something which is called the hepatitis B panel. 
the hepatitis B panel is a series of tests that are commonly offered um, by a doctor. So if you if your doctor thinks that you may have hepatitis B or you should be tested for it, they may offer you this hepatitis B panel. Now, there's also the hepatitis B surface antibody. Now, this is a test that tests for cells your body produces if exposed to the hepatitis C virus and or vaccine. It is not in the WHO guidelines and it is part of the hepatitis B panel. There's also the hepatitis B core antibody. Um, so this test for cells your body produces um, if exposed to a different part of the hepatitis B virus. And it is not in the WHO guidelines and it is, it is part of the hepatitis B panel. There also are other tests, um, which are anti-hepatitis B core IgM or IgG. And these test for cells, um, very specific cells your body produces if exposed to hepatitis B virus under certain circumstances and it's not in the WHO guidelines, and it's not part of the hepatitis B panel. There's also the hepatitis B E antigen. Now, this tests for part of the hepatitis B virus, that the virus usually produces when very active in your body. This is a simplified explanation. Um, hepatitis B E antigen can be cyclical. Um, you, can, you can be producing the have lots of virus be producing in your body and BE antigen negative. But for the sake of this video, um, we're going to kind of simplify this to the definition here. Now this is in the WHO guidelines and the prevention of mother to child transmission section. There also is the hepatitis B E antibody. So this tests for cells that your body produces in reaction to the hepatitis B E antigen, and that is not in the WHO guidelines. And then there's a hepatitis B virus DNA quantification, or the viral load. And this is a test that can estimate how much hepatitis B virus is in your body. And this is in the WHO guidelines. Okay, so now that we got that sorted, let's move on to the WHO hepatitis B testing algorithm. So there are two WHO hepatitis B testing algorithm. The first one is the prevention of mother to child transmission of hepatitis B virus guidelines on antiviral prophylaxis in pregnancy. This came out uh, in July of 2020. And this is specifically for pregnant women. Now the other hepatitis B guideline is the guidelines on hepatitis B and C testing. And this came out in 2017. Now, there is uh, more information, so there's also guidelines on hepatitis B uh, treatment. Since that is out of scope of us, we are not covering that, but that is an additional guideline that WHO has. Okay, so the first part of the WHO guidelines, serological testing for hepatitis B. So, Step number one for both the WHO PMTCT, Prevention of Mother to Child Transmission Guidelines, and the WHO Hepatitis B Testing Guidelines. So the first step is a Hepatitis B Surface Antigen Test. If you are Hepatitis B Surface Antigen positive, you are considered to have the Hepatitis B virus. If you're Hepatitis B Surface Antigen negative, you are not considered to have the virus. So what is a serological test? It is an assay that detects the presence of antigens or antibodies, typically in serum or plasma, but also in capillary or venous blood and sometimes oral fluid. So serological tests can include rapid diagnostic tests called RDTs and laboratory-based amino assays. And here we have a picture of what an RDT looks like. It's usually used in the primary healthcare setting. Um, it's a, often a, a cassette body, so like a kind of plastic strip, versus um, an AIA or a chemoluminescent assay, which are um, much more complex, and usually you do many samples at one time. So when thinking for a screening through for hepatitis B, you can think about the centralized and decentralized setting. So centralized setting is usually like a, a district hospital or a tertiary hospital, a large health facility. Decentralized can be something like a primary health care or a, you know, a health outpost or clinic um, or a polyclinic, depending on your country. Now, in decentralized settings, you can um, 
uh, test for hepatitis B surface antigen using an RDT, a rapid diagnostic test. And this can be done by a trained healthcare worker, usually with capillary blood, um, sometimes with plasma. And the turnaround time is five to 20 minutes. Now with the centralized settings, that would be the AAs or the, the chemoluminescent immuno assays, also another tongue twister. And this is a, requires a well-equipped lab, a qualified lab technician. It's done on plasma and serum most often, and it usually takes um, uh, two hours or more. There also is the option to do what we call dried blood spots, or DBS. And what this allows is you collect the sample at the decentralized setting with a finger prick and putting a blood spot on a specialized paper. And you can send it to the centralized setting where they can then do that test on the large platforms. Now currently, this is what we call off-label, which means that the manufacturers have not said, this is the protocol that you should follow if you are collecting dried blood spots and then want to use it on our big machines. So um, we would need to understand um, if the manufacturers would provide those instructions and then how well um, the testing outcomes are after you follow a protocol. So to talk about some hepatitis B rapid diagnostic tests that are WHO pre-qualified or Global Fund Expert Review Panel on Diagnostics, from now on I'm gonna say ERPD um, on those two lists. So here we see the product name, the manufacturer, the performance, sample type, if it's WHO pre-qualified, and um, what stringent regulatory authority that it may have. So um, a few things to note. There are not so many. <laughs> that's, that's one of the things to note. And um, another important thing to note is that um, some of them are no longer being manufactured, such as the VICA hepatitis B service antigen. Um, another important thing to realize is that the performance here, so these performance numbers are uh, from systematic review where possible, but for the SD bio line, it's only from, it's, it's from one study. Um, whereas the ones from a systematic review look at the performance of the test in a lot of different studies and then pool that information together. In, generally speaking, if you get information from a systematic review, you can feel more confident in that data because it looks at a bunch of different studies. So it's not as likely to be swayed by other factors. Like maybe a test performs a certain region in one population um, and performs a different way in another population. So by looking at the results all together, you're able to have a, a stronger confidence in the performance of the test. So then moving on to the hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, so these are the non-RDTs. So these are the big laboratory um, based ones. And here we see um, that two are WHO pre-qualified and one is on the ERPD list. Another option for testing for hepatitis B surface antigen would be combo testing. So this is still that first step of the WHO algorithms, but what multiplex serological testing or combo test is, is it's, um, it's integrating the diagnosis of hepatitis with other tests. So for example, you could have a test that had hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. Um, here in this table, we see a few of the different options for combination tests um, that include hepatitis B. Now, potential benefits of this could be you only need one sample. So you would put the one sample and the test would show results for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, for example. Um, so it might have the ability to make testing um, more simple. You only have to use one sample. You don't have to do three different tests. However, you know, it may add some complications. A healthcare worker would have to do pre and post count test counseling for three diseases instead of maybe just one or two. Um, and all of these tests currently need independent evaluations, right? So we um, don't have any data or not a lot of data right now on the performance of these tests that comes from an independent source. So we're just flagging that out there as a potential option um, that once more work gets done on the, on the field validation and kind of understanding how these tests work in a health system, it could be uh, an interesting option to consider for testing. 
So now we have the second step. So the testing for chronic hepatitis or PMTCT prophylaxis. So this is step number two on both of the WHO guidelines. And it's prompt or reflex hepatitis B DNA or hepatitis B E antigen for PMTCT only. So um, when you are testing for chronic hepatitis B or PMTCT prophylaxis, it's the same consideration of the centralized versus the decentralized setting. So in the decentralized setting, you have um, hepatitis B DNA that is available um, uh, currently right now in the um, Cephea gene expert. Um, and you also have hepatitis B E antigen RDT um, for the hepatitis B E antigen. Now, this can be done in district hospitals. Um, the hepatitis B E antigen could also be done in the primary healthcare centers, and um, it requires a trained healthcare operator. The specimen type is uh, capillary blood or plasma. And the turnaround time for the hepatitis B DNA um, is around 90 minutes, whereas the turnaround time for the hepatitis B E antigen uh, RDT is less than 20 minutes. You also have the centralized settings where you could do hepatitis B DNA on the large high throughput um, platforms. You can also do hepatitis B E antigen on platforms such as the Abbott Architect. These require a well-equipped lab, qualified lab technician, usually done on plasma and serum, and can take um, several hours to get the results. And they're usually done on what we call batch samples. So you have to get a bunch of samples um, and then once you have a certain number, maybe 20 or uh, 30 or 90, then you run the, the test at one time for all of those different samples. So here are some of the hepatitis B virological technologies that have completed um, WHO, uh, well, at this point, ERPD. Um, WHO pre-qualification is um, working towards being able to review the hepatitis B um, DNA technologies. So here, the list we've got four that are considered um, on the expert uh, review panel for diagnostics. These are the big centralized machines. If you wanna think about um, the different characteristics of these big centralized machines, it's important um, to understand that each of these machines can do other tests as well, right? So here we have a list of some commonly found um, high throughput platforms throughout the world that may or may not yet be on the ERPD list, um, but they can do things such as HIV, uh, viral load and early infant diagnosis, um, human papillomavirus, hepatitis C virus, tuberculosis, and it's really important when you're thinking about what high throughput platform to consider that each molecular instrument it possesses unique features which need to be considered and you need to figure out like how it fits within the whole laboratory network. You don't really wanna buy a, a machine that can do 10 tests just to do hepatitis B when you already may have a machine in your lab that could do hepatitis B. Um, you just need to consider how you could situate the workflow to incorporate both. Um, so uh, hopefully you can review this slide at your leisure. There's a lot of information on here. But just to highlight that the, the COBAS, the Catman, and the M2000 are those batch testing. So you have to wait for a lot of samples to come at one time before you can test. And the um, Hologic is random access. So that one you can put in a test and have it going and then put in another test and have it going at a different time. So now to talk about some of the point of care and near point of care technologies available for hepatitis B um, viremia testing. And there is at uh, this point, the hepatitis B DNA test for the Cepheid expert. Um, we would hope that there are other tests that become available on the international market um, on some of the near point of care platforms. Um, that could be a really great advance. So to speak a little bit about the hepatitis B E antigen rapid diagnostic test. So there's very limited information available. Um, what we see here on this slide is a performance uh, evaluation of the hepatitis B antigen RDTs. And 
it ranges <laughs> quite significantly. You know, the sensitivity in some groups is as low as 29.8%, um, and it ranges as high as 52.9%. So what that shows you is that there is um, a lot of room for improvement on these e-antigen RDTs. Um, this slide here is talking about um, more information on the performance of the hepatitis B E antigen RDT. Um, it only, the systematic review that was commissioned by WHO only included one study that used um, E antigen RDT. The other studies that were used were using the E antigen um, larger lab platforms, which um, have higher sensitivities. So this is to say that there's a paucity of evidence. So there's not very much evidence at all in the performance of E antigen rapid diagnostic tests. More evidence is needed, especially among the HIV positive women. Um, so we hope that the global community can be working to fill those research gaps because they're very important ones. And now to talk about liver staging. Because if you were reading the um, WHO guidelines uh, closely, you will have seen that you know, there is a recognition that hepatitis B DNA testing can be really difficult to come by. So you can also um, understand the need for treatment based on a person's liver staging, particularly the, the ALT levels. And so to quickly talk about um, some of the existing liver staging options. So you have biochem, um, so those biochemical tests, and that can be things such as um, complete blood counts, full blood counts, and you can use different ratios, an APRI or a FIB4, um, or you can look at the ALT level um, as well. Then there's the fiber scan. And so this is a machine which can provide liver staging results. It's, um, it's a very fancy machine. It is expensive and it requires a trained tank technician and it's not very easy to move it's not like a truly portable device and is not widely available in all countries or contexts you can also look at ultrasound for a liver staging option and now the advantages of ultrasounds are that the machines are um, often readily available in uh, district hospitals sometimes even primary health care centers um, however it requires a very well-trained technician to do ultrasound for liver staging and the wait times for ultrasound appointments can be really long as other patient types may be prioritized, such as pregnant women. So this is a very quick overview of um, hepatitis B diagnostics, particularly in the frame of the WHO guidelines. It's a lot of information, um, but we wanted to try and fit it in in 30 minutes. So I think that I just managed to. Um, so we really thank you for spending the time with us today. And if you want to learn more about hepatitis B diagnostics, if there's other things you would like us to cover about hepatitis diagnostics in general, please do let us know. It's been really great to collaborate with World Hepatitis Alliance on the series of videos, and we would love to do more. So um, please feel free to contact us. Let us know what you thought about this video, what are areas we can improve on, and what more you want to see from us. And we look forward to um, joining you again in 2021 and continuing this hepatitis journey. So thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.